speech today. So shall we go and start learning? Okay. Um, oh. Hello. If you ever do what I do, you'll learn to be disgusted by, the, by your own countenance. It happens. Okay. Rabbi, why, why, Patel? Okay. Rivka. Uh, Maya. Devora. Uh, Rotem. Rotem. Shira, Rivka. They're both here. I'm just not sure which is which. Shira. Rivka, Shira, pardon me. Uh, hi, Rabbi. Rabbi, I'm Stop sorry. Talking, lady. You gotta be quiet. Yeah, sure. I just wanted... I just wanted you to make attendance. I'm Rivka Bindiewska. Oh, what is your name? <laughs> Bindiewska, Rivka Bindiewska. I'm listening to you. Oh, Rivka. Okay, Shalom Aleichem. Good morning. Very good. Okay. Shalom Aleichem. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Hello. Sarah, yes. business. Yes. And Chava, you're new? Yes. This is your first time you're here? No, no. You, in this class. How do you pronounce your last name? Krimko, what country of origin is this? Russian? What does it mean? No idea. Krimko. Only, Krimko isn't really a Jewish name, but everyone we know who has the name is Jewish. Yeah. Krimko. Krimko. Yeah. Yeah. So I met another Krimko one time, and they said he was like a story behind the name. Oh, so you, so you don't know it? Yeah. Oh, and who are you? What's your name? Sarah who? Nachmias. Sorry, I want to tell you something. I'm a very, very jealous man. So it's either me or the telephone. It's not both. My ego is not going to handle it well. I'm going to assume Nachmias is N A C H M I A S. So it's N A H. Now you're descendants of the Ramban, I'm going to guess, with a name like that. Mavish. Uh, far. Obviously far, but you, <laughs> you know that you're descended from the Ramban, the Nachmanides. Yeah. Wow. And your father is a direct descendant? In other words, father, no. son, father, son, father, son? No, like further. No, I mean a patrilineal line. Father, son, father, son, rather than father, mother, uh, father, mother. I, I don't exactly know like, the, the, the chain. The and your, your roots are Israeli or Spanish? Morocco. Morocco. Very interesting. Okay. Nachmias. There are people named Maimon. Yeah. Maimon. They're Mamish Ben Achaben. Father, son, father, son, till the Ramah. Could you imagine? I find out. You should find out. I had a girl in my class. And this is much closer, but it's still quite impressive. Her name was Benatar. Benatar is the name of the Erechaim. He lived in times of the Baal Shem lived 750 years ago, 800 years ago. He was born... He was born, I think, in 1264. It's a long time ago, 1264, right? Uh, it's 750 yes. years ago. Uh, but he was one of the greatest we ever had, Mamish. He was a, a Kabbalist and a scholar and a you name, but he wasn't. The Nachmanides, Ramban. Okay. Right, but you should know that the Guraris are also, the Maral's last name, the Guraris and the Gurari family, the Marals wrote a book called Gur Adia, I think. Okay, they're staying a little funny. Also, a lot. I blame everything on COVID. Thank God for COVID. Yes. What would we do without COVID? <laughs> what would we do without COVID? Okay. Um, you can laugh at the staples if you so desire. Permission is granted for that. Um, what I want to tell you. What did I want to tell you? Um, so, so there's the, right, so the, the um, Maral's, all the Gararis are also direct descendants of the Maral, but you're sure that this, this name Lo is Maral, in fact, direct? Yeah, because they're from, from the That's family. proof. Mm -hmm. right. right. Thank you, thank you. But the Nachmanid, the Maral is 455 years ago. The Nachmanid is 800 years ago. Oh, okay. To be able to have a name from under the Rishonim, and you know certainly that you're a descendant, it's, it's very special. I'm, I'm not taking away from anybody else, you know. My, um, I know someone else 
Right, I understand. My yichus sees that my zayin was Avram Avinu, and I can handle that. <laughs> it's also not bad. You know. It's not the same thing because we're a big deal. We're all the sons of Avram Avinu, so we're all related. Yep. As I get older, as I get older, I'm not as smart as I was, but I guess you could say I get more spiritual. And I feel more and more. I feel, I don't understand. I feel more and more how special it is to be a Jew. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. One was the recorder, one was the broadcaster, so don't worry about it. Why am I using this instead of a camera? That's because that's what the people who take care of my technology decided. So there. Yeah. <laughs> Open to the glass. For your YouTube channel? Yeah, well, I have it online I, inside Hasidus. I have my own site. I don't know about YouTube. YouTube is a bit neglected at the moment. We're trying to fix that. We're going to fix that. IYH. Immune session. Okay, now let's lower it. What do you think of this? Yeah, this tripod is so cool. Okay. Anyway, I wanted to say that Chaim had no sons. So if someone has the name Ben Atar, Ben Eter, it's impossible for him to be a direct descendant of Chaim because he only had daughters. A patrilineal. I mean, obviously he could be direct, but patrilineal. So the word is that one of his children, grandchildren, who one of, one of his daughter's children took the last name Benete. And you have a girl coming into Mokhan Khan, and she's a direct descendant of Erechaim. It's, it's very special. But Nachmias. Uh, Nachmias. That's amazing. Do you know the story of the Ramban? He lived his life in Spain. And um, in Castile, I believe, Castilia, Spain was different states. And for much of that early history, it was split between Muslims and Christians. And the Jews did better under the Muslims than they did under the Christians. And when the Christians succeeded in pushing the Muslims off the peninsula, that's when they kicked out the Jews. You understand? As long as the Christians and the Muslims were fighting, the Jews were the bankers. They were paying the bills on both sides. And uh, when the Christians won, and the Christians kicked the Muslims across the straits in, from Europe into Africa, to Morocco, they kicked out the Jews. The Rambans, this is 14, 15th, 15th century, late 1400s. The Ramban lived in the 13th century. He was born in 1267, I think. He passed away 13 something or other. So this is way before. It's more than 200 years before the expulsion. But he lived in already a Christian part of Spain. He was no longer Muslim. And um, he was forced to debate with a, uh, a Christian apostate, a woman, a Jew who had crossed over to Christianity. And uh, there were a lot of debates. They forced the Jews to have debates. Jews never wanted to have debates with Christians because they could only lose. They couldn't win mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. But he was told that he, so this woman, this apostate, he said that he's going to prove the, the veracity of Christianity and Yoshke from the Gemara, from Teshbal Pet. That was his novelty. And the Rabban had no interest in debating him. And the king said to him, you, you have a free hand, you can say whatever you want. It won't be held against you. You can say whatever you have to say. So the Ramban came and debated this apostate and he mopped the floor with him. It was just really, really unfortunate. You watch the poor guy trying to make his case. He had won my Mechazal, I kept on repeating it. And the Ramban is dancing around him. But then the Ramban wrote it up. He wrote up the whole debate and he sent it, he disseminated it. And the king arrested him. He said, wait a minute, we made a deal that I could say whatever I want. He said, yes. I allowed you to say whatever I wanted in your palace, but why did you go and announce to the whole world? So he had to leave Spain. And he moved to Israel. The Ramban spent the last years of his life in Israel. And the Ramban was a holy man. And when he came to Israel, he felt the holiness of Israel. You and I come to Israel, I don't know what we feel, but holy people, he felt Kedusha Sa'adat. And he fell in love with Israel. I had an uncle who was a historian who says the Ramban was the first Zionist. He, was a Zion. he loved that Israel. And in his later writings, his, his obsession with the Holy Land is incredible. He holds that the Yiddishkeit is really meant for Israel. We do it outside of Israel, so we should be in practice. We move that to Israel. 
And I think he passed away. No, I think he's buried in Israel. But apparently his descendants moved from Israel to Morocco. And you came from Morocco to America. Okay, I'm wasting time, right? I'm talking about you and you don't like it. But that's what happens when you come to class. Don't worry, next week I'm going to ignore you. Okay, Kindelach, we're back. Okay, we're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. And if you don't think that the reason you're in this school is because your great grandfather, that Amban, is <laughs> pulling strings, <laughs> then you don't understand how big a miracle it is that we exist. Every Jew who knows he's a Jew has a holy, holy Zayda or a bunch of them who are doing a lot of praying up there. And that's why we end up here. Oh, Hashem. Okay, shall we? So we're stopping Siddur and we're going back to the Chumash. And what we do, as you know, is we don't learn the Sikha and the Pasha based on the week. We're doing a journey. We're going through the Chumash, studying the, the story, the narrative, the story of the Bible, the story of the Chumash. And we're, this, we're, more, we're probably doing this more than 10 years. In other words, you're getting out in the middle of the ride. And if you want to hear the whole story, go to the website inside chassidus.org and it's all there. We started with Avram Avinu. And my, my cliche is, my slogan is, my one-liner is, the Torah is a history book. But it's not the history of the world. Torah is a history book, but it's not the history of the world. It's the history of the purpose of the world. Toyota tells the stories of the world as it relates to why God created it and what God wants from it. And it explains why some things are given so much attention and other things are either ignored or glossed over or given very little attention because the entire structure of the Toyota is, it's a history book, it tells a story. And the story that it tells is literal, it's actual, it happened. But it doesn't tell the story of everybody and everything. It tells the story of the purpose of the creation. And it starts with individuals. When Hashem created the world, his plan was to have a nation. But before he was going to have a nation, he was going to have a perfect couple. And that perfect couple was, was Avram and Sarah. And they became, by the virtue of their righteousness, and they're being tested 10 times and passing each of those tests, the patriarch and matriarch, the father and mother of the Jewish people. And then for reasons that we discussed, the Jewish nation is not born right away. Abraham and Sarah have one son named Yitzchak, who marries a girl named Rivka, and they have one son named Yankev, who marries a few girls named Leah and Rachel, and Bila and Zilpah. He's got 12 sons, all of them born outside of Israel, and they're all tzaddikim. And then we go to Mitzrayim, we suffer an unimaginable challenge, and we emerge as a nation. We're born as a nation. And of course, the way the story goes is that first Hashem, sought, he looked for one perfect tzaddik to be the father of his nation. And then that had to evolve and that had to morph, metamorphose into a people, into a nation. But in as much as they were going to be a nation, they were going to be plural, a plurality. They're not all going to be tzaddikim, right? The Jewish people are a tzibur, a community. And the word tzibur is an acronym. It's an abbreviation for tzaddik, benini, verosha. A community consists of righteous, average, and below average. And he starts off this process by seeking a perfect individual. And when that perfect individual emerges, he makes from his descendants a people, a nation. But there's a, an interruption, it's a break. The Ramam describes it also, that the righteousness of those individuals is completely erased. And from their descendants, he starts all over again and he builds the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And this, of course, explains our exile and it explains our redemption. Our exile and our redemption are the purging, are the cleansing of the purifying process, which gives birth not to an individual righteous person who was a tzaddik or a tzitkanis, but the entire nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And we go out of Mitzrayim and we cross the sea. And we were given all kinds of gifts, right? We were given clouds, we were given mon, we were given water, and we complained over and over again, right? And then we were ready to get the title. Um, if you'll go to my website, if you'll go to my website, you'll see that this Sikhs class, it, it, it's in, I have a section of my called Sikhs. In my section called Sikhs, I have a subsection that's called themes. 
in the subsection that's called themes, <laughs> I have the history of the Jewish people. I forgot what I call it. In the history of the Jewish people, I've got four folders. The first folder is called the Ovis, the Patriarchs and Matriarchs. The second folder is called Yosef and his brothers. The third folder is called From Exile to Redemption. And the fourth folder is called You Are Not Free Until You Are a Servant of God. That's the name of the folder. I know that's a funny long name, but that's the name of it. We went out of Egypt. So our masters were taken away. When did we become free? We became slaves of God. Now that sounds ironic. It sounds weird. How do you become free by being servants of God? And of course the answer is, when you're attached to something much larger than yourself, and in this case, when you're attached to something which is infinite and something is true, that association give, empowers you to be free. To be The word free, as I translate it, is not I can do whatever I want, <laughs> right? But whatever I want, I can do, right? I can do whatever I want because I can eat pizza and I can sleep late and I can wear dirty clothing, right? Whatever I want, I can do means that if I want to stay up a whole night and study, I have the ability. If I want to eat healthy, I can do it. If I want to not expose myself to inappropriate images or whatever it is, I can stop myself. That's freedom. Freedom means I own me. And if I don't own me, if I'm a slave, if I have to look at this image or listen to this sound or eat this food or dress with this outfit or in some way be intimidated by things around me, then I'm a slave. And we're free in our relationship with God. Our freedom is this being connected to God, and God makes a lot of demands, right? He has so many things that he needs and wants from us. But those demands are not just demands, they're, they're his empowering, they're giving him, giving us the kayak to be free. And again, the meaning of the word free is that whatever I need to do, I can do, even if it's difficult, and even if it's unpopular, because it's right and it's righteous, I'm able to do it. This is the freedom of the Jewish people. So this is the fourth section in my in my, uh, my section on Sichas of the Rebbe that follow the, the history of the Jewish people, I call it, you're not free until you're a slave of HaKadosh Baruch. And it begins with this Pasha, Yisrael, um, which Pashlach HaPratis is the Chitasa this week, right? That's, that's interesting, right? We went back to the Chumash. Today is Wednesday. We're actually, if you look at the first page, today's Chumash that we're about to read is from, from today's Chitas. That's a, that's a wink from God that says, I like what you're doing. I, I, I didn't think about it till this second. I spent a lot of time preparing this morning. But this look, today is Wednesday, Yisrael. we're going to be learning the first couple of sukkah, but Wednesday, Yisrael. like I said, this is a, the Ebishter agrees that we should have stopped learning Seich Meginis and got back to the Chumash. This is his, his wink. I, it just happens to me often. I, it's very heartening. It feels good. Little indications that the the, the uh, what's the word? The stars are aligning correctly. I mean, I, I didn't think about it until this second. So, it's a gewaldic ashgacha. It's a very beautiful ashgacha. So we earlier this year we learned about yesterday, and what we learned about yesterday was that the Zoya says that yesterday represents all of secular knowledge, all knowledge that's called chitzonia, separated from God, and his agreeing to come to Har Sinai and to receive the Torah along with us and to collaborate with the Jewish peoples, accepting the Torah and studying the Torah. And like I like to say it, creating the Torah. The Zoyar says the Torah wouldn't be given if Yisrael wouldn't come. The Zoyar says this, that Yisrael is only gonna give the Torah when the wisdom that's outside joins in receiving the Torah that's represented by the personality of Yisrael. That's how this year started. And then, of course, we talked about Yisrael telling Moshe Rabbeinu what to do, and Moshe Rabbeinu asking Hashem, and Hashem agreed with Yisrael, not with Moshe Rabbeinu. How could it be Moshe Rabbeinu was wrong and Yisrael was right? How do they say it in America? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> now, we're reading Revi, and I'm going to begin by reading Tupsokim. Okay, now girls, understand, if I were to do the whole story of Matan Teda, in succession, we wouldn't learn another Siddha class till you would be married with a child. Uh, so I'm not doing it. We're going to do a, bit, a piece to go back to Siddha, a piece to go back to Siddha, okay? Because I like to teach Siddha, and I'm still the teacher. I'm happy to do Sikhis. The, for a Siddha class, I put in three, four hours of preparation. For a Sikhis class, this week I spent a lot of time because it's the first week. It's half an hour. So it's much easier for me, but I, I have this need to learn Siddha and to teach Siddha, and you happen to be in the way, so. <laughs> oh, so we're going to begin. 
I'm reading Pasha, two passages. Ashlishi in the third month. Does everybody have a copy? Rebetzin. Ashlishi in the third month. After the Jewish people left the land of Egypt, on this day, they came to the desert of Sinai. Okay? There is a Sinai desert. And in the Sinai desert, there's a mountain. The mountain in the Sinai desert is called Mount Sinai. Now, most people think they know where the Sinai desert is. But do you know that there's a huge, huge, huge controversy about what is Mount Sinai? We don't know for sure. Nobody knows for sure where Har Sinai is. I'm not even sure we know where, where Midbar Sinai is. In other words, I think that it's possible that in the last 4,000 years, the topography has changed a lot. You know, when, when, his, when, when, uh, when people who do geography look for the journey of the Jewish people from Egypt, there's like five opinions about how they left Egypt. And there's all kinds of indications like this and like this and like this. And, and I believe that part of the reason there's such controversy is because it's possible that the topography, that the landscape changed much more significantly than we think. Uh, some of the land was flooded and made into dams and so on and so forth. Some of the lush grasslands was made into desert. And it's possible that it's hard to know where it is. But there is a place called the Desert of Sinai. And in the Desert of Sinai, there is the Mount Sinai. And the first Pusik says, in the third month of the Jewish people left the land of Egypt, on this day, they came to Midbar Sinai, the desert of Sinai. Now, girls, there's something very weird about this puzzle. It tells you what month it was. It doesn't tell you what day it was. Right? Look at it again. In the third month, it says, after the Jewish people, what should it say next? It should say, on the first day, this day. So there's a Gzeda Shava, from another Pasuk, that when it says Yoyim it means Reish Chaydish. So we know that this Pasuk happened Reish Chaydish, right? But of course, there's the old story. If I can... <laughs> I had a grandfather. I'm sorry for wasting your time with nonsense. I loved him very much, my Zaydi Stern. He was an interesting man. He was a Jew, beautiful man. Beautiful, beautiful Jew. And uh, he had Mishikas. He would sit around and entertain the whole family. And one of his fictitious characters was a guy named Armando. And Armando once told one of his children that when you drink from a cup, you should drink from this side of the cup and not from this side of the cup. So his grandson said, why should I drink from this side of the cup? Because with this, this side of the cup, you're going to drink like this. So um, you missed it. Yeah, <laughs> this cup is full of water. Otherwise, I'd show you. <laughs> anyway, if you could speak like this or like this, why would you speak like this if you could speak like this, right? Why would the Pasuk say, instead of saying, if you could speak crooked, why speak straight? And of course, Hasidus struggles with this. Hasidus explains, is written on this day, not because the Tater wants to speak in riddles, because the word Hazeh is very important. On a day that's clear, it's clear, it's direct, it's overt, like saying this, right? The point between is saying this. But Yay Mazah, on a day where everything is clear. So the Pasuk prefers to describe the day as a clear day and allow you to figure out that it was from Shava, rather than tell you explicitly that it was the first day of the month, and then you would lose that what Tayrath feels is very, very important. That Rashhaidish Siv, when the Jewish people are Sinai, it's a day called Zeh. It's a day called this, direct. It's a day of great revelation. That's the reason why. It's written in code. Okay, but on the first day of Rosh Sivan, the Jewish people arrived at the desert of Sinai, the Sinai Desert. Now, girls, they left Egypt some five weeks before, right? They left Egypt, they left Egypt on a Thursday. Okay, they left Egypt on a Thursday. Shabbos was Yud. So you had Aleph, the Bays, you had Gimel, you had Dalat as well. They left Egypt on a Thursday. A week later on a Thursday, the sea split. That was Shvi Shopesa. Um, and the, Sunday was Tezayin Iyar, Sunday, the 16th day in the month of Iyar, the month, the manna began to fall. So if, if Sunday is the 16th, so then the next Sunday is going to be the 23rd, correct? Right? And what is the next Sunday going to be? Either the 30th or the 1st. If Iyar has 29 days, then the next Sunday is going to be the Shredish. If Iyar has 30 days, then 
then the next Sunday will be the 30th, and the Shredish would be Monday. Now, did I say that too quick? Should I repeat that again? Or oh, we're good? Repeat one more time. They left Egypt on a Thursday. The sea split on a Thursday, although I'm, I'm somehow thinking that maybe they're making a mistake. The sea split on a Thursday. The mon began to fall on a Sunday. The mon began to fall on a Sunday. It was Sunday, the 16th of Eir. Okay? Now, if the mon began to fall on the 16th of Eir, when's the next Sunday? The 23rd of Eir, right? If the next Sunday is 23rd, when's the, the Sunday after that? Either the 30th or the 1st. Now, the Gemara says, Lekula alma b'shabes nit natayra. And by the way, someone, a friend of mine who knows everything told me that there's a say that ale that says different. But the Gemara says everybody agrees that the Torah was given on Shabbos. Now, if everybody agreed the Torah was given on Shabbos, what day of the month was it? It's an argument. If you had 30 days, so the Jewish people arrived at Har Sinai on Monday, which was Rish Chodesh, they got the Torah on the 6th of Sinai. But if Iyad had 29 days and they arrived on Rishchidosh, which was Sunday to Har Sinai, the Torah was given on the 7th. Everybody agrees it was given Shabbos. Everybody agrees we left Egypt on a Thursday. In other words, everybody agrees that between Yitzhak and Sinai, Monday is 52 days. We... Is Shabbos two days? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm distracted, please. Um, we left Egypt on a Thursday, we got the Tate on a Shabbos, which means the Tate was given on the 52nd day, right? Because if you start counting from Thursday, seven times seven, 49 days, gets you to Wednesday, and then you have Thursday, Friday, Shabbos. So the Tate was given on the 52nd day after it's Yitzhak Mitzrayim, which means the 51st day after they started counting days, we count 49 days and the 50th day of Shavuos. So there's an extra day here. The way our Shavuos works is um, Shavuos is the same day as the second day of Pesach. By them, Shavuos was the same day as the third day of Pesach. There's an extra day. They had 52 days, we had 51 days, which means they had 50. Uh, 50 days of Sfira and the Torah was given on the 51st. We have 49 days of Sfira. The Torah was given on the 50th. And there's reasons why there are these differences. But these are facts. That, according to the Gemara, the Torah was given on Shabbos. They arrived at Arsina and The question is what day of the week it is. The opinion of the Chachamim, which is the more widely accepted view, is that Arsina was on a Monday, which meant that Sunday was the 30th. Rabbi Yaisi holds that no, Rosh was on Sunday. Because Rabbi Yaisi holds that the Yidin were not given two days to prepare to get the Torah. They were given three whole days to prepare to get the Torah, which are things we're going to get to, as they say in the culture, IYH, at some point later on. Okay? But Rosh Chodesh, even the Yidin come to the desert of Sinai, which means you, they're traveling for about six weeks at this point. Six weeks and some. And they haven't traveled very far. If you look at a map, the, they left Egypt and now they're in the Sinai Desert. It's not that far away. It doesn't take, in other words, they walked kind of slow. And in those six weeks, they stopped over and over again. They stopped in Mora, they stopped in Elim, they stopped in Nefidim, they kept on stopping. And uh, of course, one of the features of Jewish people's stopping and starting and stopping and starting and stopping and starting was a lot of complaining. The Jews are always complaining. And they're complaining because their life is hard. Moshe Rabbeinu is moving them very fast. They want to go a little more slowly. They don't understand what the rush is. And Moshe is saying, we got to get to Har Sinai. We got to get to Torah. Okay, now girls, do you have any comments or questions? And I mean it. They left Rafidi. They came again to the desert of Sinai. And they rested in the desert. Look at the next words. Israel rested there, neged hahar, adjacent to the mountain. Now, girls, this is not Midbar Sinai, this is Har Sinai. You see, they left Rafidim, which was not far away at all, and they traveled from Rafidim to Midbar Sinai. And when they came to Midbar Sinai, they found Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, and they rested adjacent to the mountain. Okay, and uh, this mountain has many names. Earlier in the Chumash, this mountain was called 
Choyrev, Har Choyrev. But there are a variety of different names for this mountain. The most commonly used name for this mountain is Mount Sinai, Har Sinai. They came to Midbar Sinai and they rested at Har Sinai. Okay, now here again in Pasuk Bays, there are anomalies because if in Pasuk Aleph it says they came to Midbar Sinai, Pasuk Bays is starting the story over again by Yisum and Ephidim, the left Ephidim. Arguably, the first two words of Pasuk Bays should be in Pasuk Mitzrayim. It should say, right? And then it should say, the way it's written is they, they arrive at Midbar Sinai and then the next Pasuk begins that they left to feed him. And there's a discussion in Hasidus to why these words are written and why they're written in this order. Everything has a question. And everything has an answer, and Taita never finishes. There's still more questions, and there's still more answers ad infinitum. But the difference between Pasak Alf and Pasak Bay is basically is, and basically is a bad word, that in Pasak Alf they're arriving to the desert of Sinai, and in Pasak of Bay they're arriving to Mount Sinai, to the Har Sinai. They rest, and by the way, they didn't circle the mountain, they rested only on one side. The entire nation camped on one side of the mountain. In other words, the event of Har Sinai wasn't the Jewish people standing all around the mountain and Hashem looking at them from all directions. They were facing the mountain in one, in one direction. And of course, everybody knows that in this Pasuk Beis, the, the most important words that the scholars, that the rabbis, that the people who like to dig, use to dig is Vayichan Sham Yisrael. And it says Lashen Yochet, Vayichan Sham Yisrael, Israel in singular rested there, Neged Dahar adjacent to the mountain, right? In Pasuk Beis, it says, Vayisu, made a feedim. Anybody speak Hebrew? They traveled from the feedim. Vayavoy U, Midbarsin, Midbarsin. They, Lashen Rabbah, Kedem Barsin. Vayachanu, Vamidbar. They rested in the mountain. What's the next word? Vayichan. You see it? I gave you this chumash of look inside the Yich and Shami Sol Israel rested Lash and Yachit. Negative adjacent to the mountain. So clearly the Pasuk flips. You start the Pasuk speaking about the Jewish people as a collective, as a group, and you finish the Pasuk with speaking about the Jewish people as a singular, as one. And the Machilta addresses this, and of course the Rashi brings it. Everybody knows this Rashi. But the reason the Pasuk finishes and he rested rather than they rested is to teach us. The famous theme of Ish Echad Belev Echad, as one man with one heart, when the Jewish people came to Har Sinai, they were as one man with one heart. And girls, the next three Sikhs are on this theme. Maybe I'll make it into two, but this, these words, Vayich and Sham Yisrael Neged the heart is going to take some of our time, okay? And I'm asking you again, questions or comments? And I mean it. Now I'm going to listen to my grandfather and drink from this side of the cup. I drank, I didn't spill, I put it down and didn't knock it over. Those are four separate miracles. Okay, questions or comments? Now, girls, I'm not reading the rest of the text, but I just want you to understand what it says. Girls, Rashi says, I'm not reading this, I'm just telling you why I'm not reading it. Rashi says that Moshe and Hashem had a policy that he only went up on the mountain in the morning, only once a day in the morning. So the minute it says Moshe Allah Kim, we assume that it's the next day. So Pasik Aleph and Bayes are Rosh Chodesh, Pasik Gimel is Bayes Sivan. So Pasik Aleph and Bayes are either Sunday or Monday. Pasig Bays is either Monday, Pasig Gimel is either Monday or Tuesday. For right now, I'm only doing two psukim. In other words, I, I'm not spending the whole class on this chumash. I just wanted to show you the first two psukim. We're now going to begin the sikhim. And I'm asking you for the third time. Questions or comments? Um, where, is, where, where is the Geographically? It's very close by. I think it's just a place that's a kilometer away, a mill. Sure, you could see it. You could see the Har Sinai from the feeder. Is it in the it's in the desert, desert. yeah. It's in the Sinai Desert? Um, well, the the first not... answer to your question is, I have no idea. Okay. My second answer to the question is that there's a Jew who's now deceased 40 years. His name was Rabbi Aryeh Kaplan. He was 
a brilliant man. He was about Shuva. He knew he was an incredible man. He was a physicist and a mathematician and brilliant, brilliant man. He wrote many, many books in English. He was one of the most prolific authors of, of, uh, of original Torah teaching in America in English. He's a very important personality. If you ever saw the collection of books for Torah anthology, he translated them all. Rabbi Arya Kaplan has a chumash. It's called The Living Torah. Now there's about 20 chumashim called The Living Torah. If you'll get hold of Rabbi Arya Kaplan's The Living Torah, he will have a map with an approximate location for the field. He's the only person who does this. Uh, it's hard, it's very, close door, please. You know, it's hard to know 100% for sure, but he speculates. Now, on what grounds does Rabbi Arya Kaplan speculate? Because he relies on the Septuagin. The Septuagin is the oldest translation of the Nach, which was done in Greek. If you put a, a chair in front of the door, it'll stay closed. Um, at the time of the second race of Mikdash, the rabbis living in Egypt were forced to translate the Tanakh into Greek. They didn't want to do it. And they did it against their wishes. And the Gemara says that it wasn't a good thing. But that translation is before Unculus and before the other Targum that we have. And the Septuagin, the Greek translation of the Torah, is not considered, the rabbis did it, but it's not considered Torah because they were done it by force. So there's a controversy about how to view it. Rabbi Ari Kaplan feels that the rabbis who translated the Torah into Greek didn't necessarily mistranslate things unless they had a specific reason to. So because the Gemara says there were a bunch of things they mistranslated because they didn't want to have trouble. Um, but otherwise, we presume that the translations are accurate. So he takes those Greek words and identifies probable locations for many things that we don't know. Okay? So get a hold of the Living Torah. I'm sure there's a copy of it in this building someplace. And uh, look at the map. You look at this puzzle, it'll be a map, and it'll say approximate location with a question mark. He doesn't know for sure. And he probably had a whole, look at his notes, he probably had a whole reason why he speculates. But the, if I met, ah? Uh? Just to get the timeline clear. So they left the time and came to. They, 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 wait, they left the time about five weeks before. Oh. Left the time on a Thursday. This is Sunday. Yeah. Which means since they left Mitzrayim, you had. Thursday Tezvav, Thursday Chav Beis, Thursday Chav Tes, Thursday Vav, Thursday Yud Gimel, Thursday Chav, Thursday Chav Zayin. Right? You had five Thursdays since the day they left. Five whole weeks. And now it's Sunday. So it's five weeks and three days since they left Egypt. In those five weeks and three days, they've traveled half a dozen times or more. They keep on moving. They set up camp, they are two, they move to the next place. You understand? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm saying like in this concept, the time where there's... They left Rafidim and they come to Harsin. No, 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 from all of today. So they left the tribe, they came... No, 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 no. It doesn't say they left Mitzrayim. It says in the third month after they left Mitzrayim. Oh, after they left Mitzrayim. Yes. They left Rafidim and they come to Sin. That's all it says. So what's the reason? But that's not that way, but I'm starting from all of this. Yeah, but it doesn't say they left Egypt. It says, okay, so it says third month after they left Egypt. They came to the Mid Bar Sin, correct. But they came to the And they left from Rafidim before they came to the Sada Desert in a place called Rafidim. So Rafidim is not in the Sada Desert. Okay. I told you once I don't know. So you're asking me, could you close, put the chair back yeah, against the door? I'm just like I already pointed that out. I pointed out that the psukkah are not in sequence. So <laughs> oh, they're not in I told that to you. Oh. Why, why did you notice it? Because I showed it to you. So why is it repeating like the same repeat? Again, there's a reason, but we're not going into that. At least, at least not at the moment. We're not, we're not... I'm trying to teach you the story of the Chumash through the Sikh of the Rebbe. In other words, you could sit on every word forever if you wanted. Here. Welcome. Okay, so now we have a sikha right behind this page in Chumash. If you open it up, you have a sikha. And we're going to be learning the sikha this week, okay? Okay, and if you find the way the staples are stapled funny, you can laugh. We have permission from Mrs. Yavi. <laughs> okay, and if you don't like my sense of humor, you can laugh. If you do like my sense of humor, you can certainly laugh. So laugh, just laugh. <laughs> it works. Okay, so now girls. Again, if you've been in the Sikhs class, which means if you've been to the beginning here, you've had this before, 
I underlined words, and you'll notice I didn't underline that many words. We're not learning the whole sikha, we're just learning my underline, which is how you get through a sikha in 40 minutes. <laughs> you just read a couple of words and you, you move around. I, in other words, I learned the sikha and I took out all the questions and I took out what I don't want to teach you in the sikha that may be very important, but it's not important for us. We're just learning pieces of the sikha that are relevant to how we want to understand this puzzle. If you'll follow my underlines, you'll be fine. If you won't follow my underlines, you'll be confused and lost and entangled. Okay, did I threaten you yet? Did I intimidate you? Look inside. It says in our text, and Israel rested there adjacent to the mountain. Right, you opened it up. The Jewish people rested adjacent to the mountain, says Rashi. As one man with one heart. Every other time the Jewish people traveled and rested. Tarumais means protests. Umachlaikis and machlaikis means dissent. For those who don't speak English, dissent means that they were arguing and fighting. Okay? Tarumis means complaints and machlaikis means arguments. Now, girls. Now, girls. Numero uno. There's a fascinating corollary to this. We're learning Yisrael, right? Jethro, right? Last week was Bishalach. In Pasha's Bishalach, you have a very similar pasuk. The Jew leave, right? They get caught up in this place called Pihachires. The Egyptians find out that the Jewish people don't know where they're going. They're starting to wander aimlessly and they decide to go after them, correct? The Jewish people look behind them and they see that they're being followed by the Egyptians. What is the biblical expression for the Jewish people observing that the Egyptians are chasing them? And behold, alas, Egypt is traveling behind them. Also in Lashon Yochet. It doesn't say Mitzrayim Noishim, it says Noiseya in singular. So what Rashi says in Apostolic? Belevechot Ishechot. In our Apostolic, it says there's one man with one heart. In that Apostolic, it says with one heart as one man which is so fascinating, right? The Jewish people come to our scene and they rest as one person with one heart. The Egyptians chase the Jewish people out of Egypt as with, as with one heart as one man. And in this sikha, the part that we're not going to learn, the Rebbe explains why this difference exists, why the Jewish people travel as one person with one heart and the Egyptians travel with one heart um, as one person. And it's, it's a very, very significant, significant observation. We will... We'll press on that nerve when we get to this point in the Sikha Mitz Hashem because it's what the Rebbe does in the Sikha is, is a lot more profound than it seems initially. It seems that the Rebbe just explaining a medrash, but he's, he's revealing a, a depth about the significance of this event. Here's the bottom line Is arguing and disagreeing and complaining a good thing or a bad thing? Is arguing and complaining and disagreeing a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, it's a good answer. Anybody else? Let's argue about that. <laughs> the correct answer to that question is, it's life. It's life. Good or bad, this is how it is. People disagree. And people clutch and complain. It's normal. Right? It's normal. And you're correct that you can do it a right way, you can do it a wrong way. Now, if you're a group of intelligent people, of intelligent people, you're smart, and you're involved personally with God. Now we think we're involved personally with God, right? Because we have a Shulchan Aruch and we do what the Shulchan Aruch says. We're not involved personally with God. Personally with God means every day God comes along and he tells you a prophet. Today, tell him to stand on one leg. Tomorrow, tell him to do this. And after that, tell him to do this. Yidin were in personal touch with God. Every day they were getting new instructions. I must tell you, but if you will think about that realistic, you, you will realize that it's not so much fun. To be this close to God is kind of difficult. You know why? You're so afraid of making a mistake. Here's the problem with God. God never tells you why. He just tells you what? Walk. Okay, so I walk. When, the, <laughs> when should I stop? Don't ask questions. Walk. <laughs> That's a sin right there. You ask the question. You walk. Some of them walk and walk and walk, keep walking, walk. And then you walk and you walk and you walk. And you say, when can I stop? I said, walk. 
it's not so much fun to be that close to God. It's not, I mean, to say it in practical terms, it's not so much fun to be close to a prophet. Because prophets repeat the words of God. When they repeat the words of God, there's no margin for error and there's no explanations. It's just what you got to do. Okay? Now, the Jews leave Egypt. And I've told this to you 50 times, probably. If not 50 times, I've told you 25 times. Many, many, many times. The Jewish people are doing nothing. God is doing all the work. And he's performing multiple miracles that are incredible miracles at a very, very rapid rate. We are the recipients of, of divine benevolence and bounty in an unprecedented and a never repeated way. The Jewish people are experiencing intimacy with Hashem that has never been experienced before by a nation. I'm not talking about individual people. And has never been experienced since till Mashiach comes. This kind of closeness to Hashem by such a large group of people has never happened. Okay? Now, here's the question. If God's doing all the work and the Jewish people are doing nothing, exactly what, what, what entitles them to it? Why do they deserve it? Of course, simple answer is because they had holy Zaydis, holy grandparents, right? Like Nachmanides over here. <laughs> right? Hey, look at Zaydis. Holy Zaydis. So we're a shtickle yid. We know we're Jewish and it means something to us because we had holy, holy, holy ancestry, right? That's a good answer, yeah. But that's not enough. You got to say they had to do something. So the second answer, what do you mean? They did two whole mitzvahs. They did a bris milah and they brought a carbon Pesach. They're, you know, as my boss says, mamasha mezen, they're incredible. They did two mitzvahs and therefore they deserve a thousand miracles and God literally carries them like a mother carries an infant son, child, and it's unreal, right? Not enough, right? So what exactly did the Jewish people contribute to this unique, most unique event in the history of the world, in the history of the purpose of the world, where God takes, a guy takes a nation out of a nation, and he takes them to Harsina, he makes them his own, he makes a covenant with them, he gives them a Torah. What did we do, girls? We did one thing and one thing only. We trusted and we followed. We trusted and we followed. Right, we left Egypt, we went out into a desert, we didn't worry about food, we trusted, who feed us? And we followed and we went wherever he told us to go. We trusted and we followed. That's all we contributed, that's our entire participation. In the Rosh Hashanah davening, we quote a pasuk from Tanakh, which is a very important pasuk. The people made a song out of it. Amar Hashem, so says God Almighty. Zacharti loch, I remember for you, chesed nuraiach, the love of your youth. Avas k'lisoyach, which means the affection that you showed me when we became betrothed. We're going to marry. Lech teich acharev amidba, that you followed me into the desert, the Eretz lays you into a land which is not fertile. It's because every Rosh Hashanah, when we're looking for Hashem to look at us with a, with a good eye rather than with a bad eye, we remind him of what we did at Har Sinai. It's called zikorin, zikreinis. So, Harti, I remember that you trusted me. So all the Jews are doing is trusting. So, if I came to you and say, listen, I'm going to make your life incredible, okay? But all you got to do is trust me. What are the chances of you trusting me? Very small. And I don't blame you. Why would you need to trust me, right? But what if I have a record, a track record of being a good guy and helping people out? I say, I'm big with just trust me. Right? Trust me. Okay, so you trust me. But every once in a while you say, well, we're just going to end. What am I doing? I wonder you come here and you go to there, back and forth, back and forth. Blah. Trust me. Trust. As time passes, it becomes very, very difficult to trust. Okay, now here's the key. The second key, the first key is that the Jewish people expressed it to trust and follow. There's a second key. And the second key is that things are unfolding unbelievably quickly. It's happening very rapidly. It's happening very, very fast. The whole situation, a year before we were slaves, a year before we were slaves, slaves, Worse than slavery in America. One year before, 12 months early, we were slaves. And the last 12 months, we threw off the yoke of our masters. We watched our masters suffer. We stole, frankly, all of their wealth, left their land, went off into a desert. And we have a relationship, a personal relationship with Hashem. Now, do you understand the psychology of a slave? Do you understand the 
the psyche of a person who was treated by another human being as a commodity, a commodity as a treated chicken or a goat or a cow. Our self-esteem, what? <laughs> How bad was our self-esteem? Huh? It's not even on the self-esteem gr uh, graph. You know, there's no number. Our lack of conditioning, we were slaves. Slaves don't own themselves. Slaves don't think, slaves don't reason, slaves just eat food when you put it in front of them and they try to survive the beatings of their master. That's all, slaves. One year later, God says, trust me. And we did. But if you appreciate the psychology of a slave, you understand that that was incredibly difficult. It was very, very hard for the Jewish people to trust. And they trusted. But you know what? The trust was tested. The trust was tested by the rapidity of the movement. Everything's happening very fast. Instead of it taking years, it's taking days. They come to a location. They park. Everybody puts up their tents. And they pitch, you know, outside the tents, their fences. So they had place for their livestock. 24 hours later, God says, move, next. So they move. They trusted him. They come to a new location. They stay there for a week or for 10 days. And they're moving again. It's, it's very exhausting. And all they have, no one's explaining anything to them. No one is telling them why. This is what you got to do. Why? What's the answer? Trust me. It gets hard. It gets hard. And huh? How did they do that? How did they do it even once? So when you read the story of the Chumash and you see the Jewish people complaining, and you say, eh, they were bad, they shouldn't have complained. You're not seeing it realistically. You're seeing it as a biblical story. You know, God says, you got to listen, right? What if God said to you, God said to me, I'm... <laughs> my number one fear when Mashiach comes is that I'm going to not listen. I'm telling you, Mashiach's going to come. He's going to give orders. We're going to have to listen. And it's not going to be easy. It's not. It's going to be simple, but not easy. Why is it not going to be easy? Because we're going to look around and see who else is listening to Mashiach. And most people are going to say, why should I listen to him? Who's he? I never heard of him. <laughs> but he's going to be Mashiach. And you're going to have to listen. And some will and some won't. You want to be from the people who listen. Once and twice and three times and a million times. The year didn't leave Egypt and everything's happening so fast. So of course they complain. And of course they argue. They listen. But they complain. Why are we moving so fast? And they argue, what is the meaning of this move? Now, I want to explain the chassidus to this, be, the, behind this a little bit. The chassidus is based on an idea which is brought in the memorandum of Eil Masse. There is a presumption. In Pashat Eil Masse, yeah. There is a presumption. And the presumption is every time the Jews move geographically, it's a symbol, it's a sign, it's a message that they have to move in terms of their avoidance and what they're doing as servants of God. Every time they go from one place to another, God's message is, okay, what you were doing until now, stop, now start doing something else. Imagine you go to school and you start learning Chumash or Mishnah and Gemara and you learn it for about six days and say, okay, no more Chumash. From now on, you're learning Zohar. Okay, Zohar. So you close the Chumash, you open the Zohar, you learn the Zohar for 10 days. Okay, close the Zohar. From now on, we're learning Diktok, Hebrew grammar. And you do that for 40 years. No more Diktok. Now we're going to learn Talmud. You got your mind. Every time they geographically move, it is a message that they have to change their avoidance, change what they're doing. So of course they're complaining. And of course they're arguing, right? What's the difference between a complaint and an argument? You complain to your superiors. You argue with your contemporaries, with your equals, right? They're complaining to Moshe. They're arguing with one another. What are they complaining to Moshe Rabbeinu? Could you give us a chance to breathe? And what does Moshe Rabbeinu say? <laughs> what does he say? Huh? No. Trust me. Trust, please, trust me. Why? Trust me. Trust me. Now, you know, the, the, it's the same cliche. If we had trusted and we had not complained, our history would have played out differently. We didn't trust. And we did complain. So our history is played out the way it's played out. But it's taken, what could have taken a very short time has taken thousands of years. And Moshe knows this. The only way the Jewish people are going to get through this incredibly rapid, rapid, rapid evolution to become the nation of Hashem is to trust. And it's very hard. So they do two things. They complain and they argue. 
They complained to Moshe Rabbeinu, give me a couple more hours. To move now? I just started learning Mishnah. I want to learn one more Mishnah. No, no, no more Mishnah. Now you're learning Zohar. <laughs> and then four days later, no more Zohar. Now you're learning whatever. So they complain. And then they argue. They complain to God and argue with one another. You see? They complain to God and to Moses. They argue. What are they arguing about? They're arguing about what is the meaning of this move. The fact that we're moving today after spending only 10 days in this place or 15 days in this place has to have meaning. What is the meaning? This is what this was arguing about. What is the meaning? Okay, now they come to Harsinai. They come to Harsinai. They, they came to defeat him a very, very short time earlier. They came to defeat him sometime in the last two weeks, last 17 days. Okay, for 16 days. Um, and in the Fidim, they had a war with Amalek. Don't ask. In those two weeks, they got the water. So many things happen. Everything is happening so quickly. And, okay, now pick yourself up for the Fidim and go to Midbar Sinai and rest at Har Sinai, the desert of Sinai and the Mount Sinai. And no Jew complains and no Jew argues. Not one. Nishka'ene. No, they're not Jewish. Jews have to complain. Jews have to. There must be some, there was something wrong with the Jewishness on that day. I'm, I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> um, this is what the Rebbe talks to. Imagine millions of people. That's what it was. It was millions of people. Are made to do something based on the logic of trust me. That's it. Trust me. And not one has an issue. Not one has an issue. No tarumas, no complaints to the Abish and the Meshach Rabbeinu, and no machloikas, there's no dissent between one another. Girls, it happened only one time. Every other time they complained, every other time they argued, for good reason. How much can I trust? Trust is hard. But on this one occasion, there's one man with one heart, there's no tarumas, there's no machloikas. So now, the Sikh is going to talk about this. And the Sikha after this is going to talk about this, and possibly the Sikha after after this is also going to talk about this. In other words, I, I've, I've started to prepare. I have a folder. So I, when we started doing Chumash, I said, I have to think ahead. I have to plan what's going to happen over the next four or five or six weeks while we're doing this. So I've already collected five Sikhas. I copied them, actually, to teach them to you. I don't know if I'll teach all of them to you, but you'll, you'll see. How, I mean, you've been in these classes. You know how it works. If you haven't been in these classes, you'll find out. <laughs> Trust me, and you really shouldn't trust me, yeah. But on this one occasion, everybody trusts, no one complains, no one argues. And the, the reason is because they achieved a station of one man with one heart, and that's what the Sikha speaks to. What is the significance of one man? And that goes, I want to ask you a question and try to think. Okay, if I gave you a choice to say one person with one heart or as one heart. In one person. How would you phrase it and why? I'm giving you two choices. As one heart, with one heart, as one man or one person or as one person with one heart, which would you choose? I mean, the, probably the correct answer is why is he bothering us? Who cares? And that's a pretty good answer, yeah. But what is your guess? You want to say something? Yeah. Go ahead. So I think one person, one heart, because I think they were already one person because a person has like different limbs and they all work together to do what, like all the parts of the body work together to do what you need to do to get somewhere. But one heart means that the emotion and then whatever you believe is all the same. So they, they, I think they were already one person. They were already one nation. But maybe they didn't all have one heart. So you're saying one heart. person counts before one heart. Yeah. That's rather profound. It's pretty good. Actually, if you look at the Sikha, you'll say that you're, you're, you're pretty on target what the Rebbe is thinking. But so now, now that you told me that, what would be the difference between saying one heart and one person, one person, one heart? One heart is just they all have the same emotions. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. What's easier? for all people to be one person or for all people to be interested in one thing? It's easier. So what's easier? Like one man or like one heart? You just changed your mind. I said it's easier, but I said that they were already one. 
Okay, but that's what, what's going to happen in the Sikhe. As one person with one heart means that their unity was based on who they were, not on what they were doing. And first they became unified as a people, and then they became unified in what they were doing. That's the one person with one heart. One heart means with the same interest. By Egypt, it was the other way around. It was one heart. They were doing the same thing, the same interest, and that's how they became one person. Now, the way the Rebbe is going to say this in the Sikha, it gets very, very interesting, is there's a Jew and there's Judaism. If a Jew is before Judaism, it's one person with one heart. If Judaism is before Jew, it's one heart as one person. A Jew is who we are, Judaism is what we do. The difference between one person with one heart and one heart as one person is, are we unified by, who, by, our, by our identity, by our personhood, or we're unified by our mission, by our task, by our life? You understand? One heart, one person, one heart means our unity came from our personhood. That's what human beings. One heart means that a unity came from what we were doing. Anyway, I just told you a lot of zeal, but you're, you're good. You were, you were good, pretty good. Okay, we're going to break. It's 5 to 12. Good, let's start 12 o'clock. We're not going to finish the zeal. I'm going to give you a chance to breathe. Okay, come back. We'll learn for 20 minutes. Okay, I, I just don't want to keep going. It's, it's not fair. Okay, so turn to page 102. Okay, when, I don't think we'll finish the Sikha now, but let's read. The, the issue that the Rebbe is talking about, it's, it's, it's a logic issue, it's a common sense issue. Is when a person does something, this is Hebrew, I don't know English grammar, but in Hebrew grammar, a person does something as an individual, it's described as the actions of one. If many people do something as a group, it's described as the actions of many. That makes sense, right? In the Chumash, it says, Vayachanu, and they rested, that's the actions of many. Vayichan Shom, and he rested, is the actions of one. And our Sikha is wondering why in Chumash, when many people do an action, there are occasions where they're described as if the many were one. And there's, of course, many answers to this question. It's a Gansi Geschichte. But that's the question on the table. If an action is being done by many people, why is it being described by doing, being done by one person? So the Rebbe sets up a, a paradigm, a cloud, a rule about how this works. Let's read it inside. Those first been a gay Arab. When you're talking about many people, you see what I'm reading? I'm assuming that that's a yes. Or the Ragansa folk, or an entire nation. Occasionally, when many people are doing one thing, you'll describe it as the actions of many. And occasionally, you'll be describing it as if one person is doing it. So that was, I'm going to give you a, a common sense reason when you will describe many people doing an action as one, that you would describe it as an action done by many. And on other occasions, you would describe it as an action done by one. The answer would be this. The simple reason to separate the two would be this. The idea that many people can be doing an action, and you'll describe it as if one person is doing it, we're talking about an action. Okay? Like to travel. Many people travel. You could describe it as one person traveling. Okay, so the Rebbe continues, right? That many people are doing one action and they're doing it in an equal way and in a unified way. It makes sense to describe the group as an individual because it's only one action. So when many people involve themselves in doing one thing together collaboratively, right? We went... <laughs> The whole school went to the park and they played ball, right? So you could say the whole school went to the park and he played ball because playing ball is not particularly profound and deep. And they all played ball together on the same level. Bottom of page 102. When you're talking about emotions, right? They went to the park and they played ball and one group was very happy and the other group was very sad. 
an attitude that comes to the mind, who creates the like for an album of a group. And of course, people, many people can do the same action and they can do it as one. But when it comes to emotions, the fact is doch. What is the English translation of the word doch? As is doch al tel right? What's doch? Anybody? Doch means emphasis. <laughs> it's an extra word. It's a redundancy, right? Then in was in them is doch. That when it comes to attitudes, feelings, the truth is doch. Emphasis. Ain't they say him? Oh, you did say him because when it comes to people's minds and heart, we're all different. Is dos alamo in oifel nirabim? If I'm not, when you're describing an activity that people are doing as a group, you can either describe them being a collective of many people, you can describe them being one. But when you're describing a group of people sharing a feeling, you would never say that they're one. Because on the emotional level, it's too subtle, it's too sensitive, it's too... Uh, ephemeral to describe them as one each one feels differently now here's a question page 103 second column you with me I'll dare, you see how quickly get through a sikha yeah al dadar zay is moving the pasha same which was in our case in the pirush apostle when it says at the second half of the second apostle that i read with you vayikhan sham israel megadot israel rested there adjacent to the mountain and the vayikhan is lost and yakh when you get the Etzel Chania, the Jewish people are, not do, are, are just resting. For the Yidden and Yenemot of the Jewish people, that place says the Rebbe in the Pasuk, Medea Freya, the words immediately before this already said, Bayacha Nuba Midbar. They collectively rest, rest in the Midbar. So if the words before say, Bayacha Nu, they collectively rest in the Midbar, that means the Jews are being viewed as a plurality. But in the next word, it says, Vayichan, it becomes a question. If we're describing what the Jewish people is doing, as Lash and Rabbim, a whole bunch of people move together, why do you follow it up immediately by saying, Muslims are going to have no choice but to say, the Apostle then follows that up and says, and he rested there, Israel rested there. Says the Rebbe Kum to Mevayer Zayin. The Pesach is coming to explain the Vayachanu, the way they rested. In other words, they Oifan Achania, the way they rested, Unachon and being prepared to Kabbalas Atera to receiving the Tera was them Dotkin Gedat Makabel Zayin that they needed to receive there. So if you look at the Pesach, right? You all, if you go back to page one, it says the Yisu made a feedim, they traveled a feedim, Vayavoy U made a feedim, they came with the Vayachan. And he rested negative. So it says Vayichan is redundant. Literally, the words before said Vayachanu. It's the same pasuk. And Vayachanu means they rested. How would you qualify they rested by saying he rested? Says the Rebbe, because the he rested is explaining how they rested. And even though there's so many people and they traveled as a plurality and they agreed about what they needed to do, and the pasuk says Vayachanu, but the midbar, they rested. You should know in this case, this collective rested as if they were one person. Okay? So Vayichan Sham Yisrael, Vayichan Uba Midbar describes what they did, Vayichan Sham Yisrael describes their unity, their, their achdas. What's the problem? What's the problem? Look at the next paragraph. The Achono, Nafshis, Und Erotzen, Und Achono, Tzumatantayr. The spiritual preparation. And the will and preparation to the giving and the getting of the Torah is doch, is doch. Anybody doch? Emphasis, very good. By yed and yid and given, every single Jew experiences, with him according to his step, umatzav in his condition, which is spiritual. We're not in the same way. If they're doing an action, they can do it together. But if they're doing something meaningful and spiritual and emotional, everybody's different. So since what they're doing is getting ready to receive the Torah, and the receiving the Torah is a very spiritual and emotional thing. Shouldn't it say Vayachan? Page 104, turn the page. Lefida hadoch. Accordingly, it should have been doch, emphasis. 
Oich da, in this case as well, we have stayed by Yachanu, Shom, Yisrael, Belach, and Abim, the Jewish people must say collectively. Why? Because everybody says, I'm going to give you common sense, right? Who wrote the book Common Sense? Anybody know the book Common Sense? Huh? Thomas Paine. Um, but <laughs> they have to write, com- every week there's been a new version of Common Sense, which makes the old Common Sense look not commonsensical, but okay, that's another story. There's, I'll give you a common sense. When you're talking about a group of people and you want to describe them as one, you'll use that form when they're doing an action. You're not going to use that form when they're experiencing motivation. Because when they're doing something spiritual and meaningful, they're a group. Here we have a problem. The Jewish people are getting ready to receive the Torah. They traveled from Rafidim, they came to Sinai, and the Torah is describing how they came, meaning the Torah is describing the kavana, the spirit behind this journey, and it says, Lashon Yachet, says, but wait a minute, you could use a singular form to describe the actions of many if it's an action. But they aren't doing an action. They're, they're doing something deeply spiritual and deeply, I'll use a very, very favorite American term, deeply personal. So why is this described as a singularity? Interesting. So what's Rashi's answer? what she said. That the unity doesn't begin with what they're doing. It begins with who they are. It doesn't begin It begins Look at the next paragraph. So now she answers this question. If the Jewish people are collectively doing something that involves a mental and spiritual and emotional preparedness, how could you describe that collective as doing it as one? Anything you do spiritually and emotionally is very personal, it's very individual, it's very diverse. Why is it Lash and Yachid? So that she answers, Un is mightig von dem Verte, dem Pastor. He quotes the Pastor of Yich and Shab Yisrael. Israel rested there. Says never, which of these three words is most important? The word Yisrael. Look, 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 look. And I circled it. If you have your text, if you actually follow it, I showed Alice Yisrael. As Jews, they were one. A unity between one and another. So this is unbelievable. It's amazing to me how you got that. That it says first to answer a question. How could a group of people be unified when they're sharing something which is so deep and emotional? And the answer is because they share something as a people. We're Jews. That's what they have in common. That commonality makes them one, and it is spiritual, and it sets up the belay bechad. Let's continue. On the achtos, and because the event of that day begins with the Jew unity of those people as a people, this unity then spills over to a unity of purpose. Hot bazeya rois as a subsequent consequence of that, they should have also one heart, all with one and the same will, believe in their heart. This is unreal. It's an analysis of a few words. And of course, it's based on the Mechilta, but it's just so beautiful, right? It's so beautiful. The Jewish people were first unified because they're Jews. And then they were unified because they're getting the Torah. Why? Because in getting the Torah, they wouldn't be unified. In getting the Torah, they were very individual. But if their journey, this particular journey, begins not by them preparing to receive the Torah, but by them joining with fellow Jews, that could be as one person. And once they find a way of being as one person, it becomes much easier than being in this one heart. And I go back to what I told you before, right? The Pasuk in Pasuk Peshach last week describes the Egyptians chasing the Jews. They were a large group of people, a large group of people. And it says also singular. says Rashi, one heart with one person. So the Rebbe can say in the Sikha, because Egyptian unity began with unity of purpose, unity of what they were doing, and it spilled over into unity of person. In our Pasha, 
The Jewish people can't achieve this unity. Why not? If you're going to develop a relationship with Hashem, if you're going to get the Tarif Mashem, you're going to have an emotional and spiritual and intellectual involvement with Akadosh Baruch Hu, the person sitting next to you is going to do it different. He's a separate person. We're all different. We're all distinctive. So it says, what brought the Jewish people together is that they're Yisrael. Israel rested there. It began with the fact that we're a common nation. We're one nation. That unity, as you correctly said, is, is, is a fait accompli. It's a fact of life. It's who they are. It's in their genes. But on that particular occasion, they chose to turn it on, right? The travel before, the travel after. They forgot that they're one nation. And they <laughs> complained and they argued. Complained to God, why are you moving so fast? They argued with one another what the movement means. But on this one occasion, we don't know why. The first thing Jewish people did was, you know, what are the, the three stooges? You know, three stooges? No. The three musketeers, right? One for all and all for one, right? Isn't that the slogan? One for, am I right or wrong? Which one comes first? One for all, all for one, or all for one and one for all? All for one, one for all. That's so easy to say, man. That is, or woman. <laughs> but you know how difficult it is to do? You know how hard what loyalty means? One for all and all for, one for all and all for one means that if one of us die, all of us die. If one of us needs to be saved, we're all going to be saved. That's, it's very powerful. It's a great slogan. It's good in a movie. <laughs> but in the reality of life, it's each his own, each to his own. And I don't mean this in a selfish way. It's the way people are. For human beings to achieve a unity, right? So here's the, I'll go back to what I said to you before. Which unity is easy to achieve? A unity of purpose or a unity of person? A unity of purpose means we're doing the same thing. A unity of person means we're all one person. That's the difference between Kish Echad and Balei Echad. Balei Echad means we're doing the same thing emotionally. Kish Echad means we're one person. The Rebbe says when the Yidin came to Har Sinai, the unity began not with getting the Torah, but with the fact that they were Jews. We come from Israel. And the unity as Jews brought them to the Leiv Echad, that when they emotionally invested in getting the Torah from the Eivishter, they felt the same way. But again, with the Kish Echad, it's one that's incredibly sweet. Well, you see that even now, like a lot of Jews, like, relatives they'll say oh I'm Jewish but they might not feel like oh but I'm atheist they're such proud Jews mm. they see the Jewish nation as a whole and that's like something that unfortunately there are some Jews who don't feel that strongly I just want you to know one of my favorite little anecdotes is I teach a Misrifka this goes back two or three years ago Hanukkah time a girl came into school and she sent it on her phone uh, on Facebook you can make uh, your own Posters, you know, it's nothing. You take a piece of paper and you choose what color and what design, and then you read whatever. So a, a person wrote, I love the Jewish religion. <laughs> it's the only religion where you can be an atheist and you're still a Jew. So some guy put it up, and the girls brought it into school, they showed it to me. So I, I, I made a whole class out of it. Right? If a person is an atheist, why do they care that they're Jewish? Because they're not an atheist. That's why. <laughs> if, if I truly don't believe in anything, so what does it mean to be a Jew? The answer to the question is, please don't ask me because you're going to make me uncomfortable. That's the answer. Please don't ask me if you're comfortable because I, I know it means something, but I don't want to admit that it means anything. But your point is well taken. You could argue that the beginning of our religious identity is our human identity as Jews. It's, it's a great question. Which comes first, the Jewish people, the Jewish religion? It's a great question. And in the, in the form of this discussion, the Jewish people is Ish the Jewish religion is Leivech. Okay, let's read one more paragraph. Yeah, but it's a very, very deep thing. Like to identify with other human beings. You have a hard enough time identifying with your brothers and sisters, your cousins. <laughs> 15 million people scattered all over the world who disagree with you on almost everything. 
The idea that Jews are a nation is a profound thing. It's not simple. Let's just read one more paragraph, okay? Page 104, second column. By Yidin, the Achtos Kish Echod is given mitzadem gufa vazezayin in Yidin. In this story, the unity between one Jew and the next begins with the fact that they're Jewish. Kish Echod is one person. On the Achtos, and this unity, top of page 105 now, that brings the one heart to Kabbalah's time to receiving the Trey. Okay, we'll continue this next week in Yitzhak Shem, and I'm going to review. I'm going I'm to bring you up to speed. Okay, let's go. Thank you for coming and listening. Go ahead, talk to me. Every person has a heart. So by saying first that you're a person,